this down. I don't know, some sort of weird suspended E minor E, or depending where you come from, weird thing, but you strum in standard and it's not like a chord, the, the strings aren't in themselves sort of resonating and supporting each other. Here you've only got three notes and you know it's major because you can hear that F sharp, third note, flat net, and you've got D minor. Okay? You can hear major, you can hear minor. Now, Dadgad, or to give it his name of a D suspended fourth tuning, is taking you into the realms of modal. Now what modal does is it's a bit like ODS, it's a bit ambivalent now. D is it major, is it minor? You don't quite know. And the advantage of that is you can play pieces and accompany pieces, both major and minor, without it striking you as being, oh yeah, that's a major because you can hear that note or that note a mile off. It's got that jarring third, tells you it's major. <laughs> so the reason it's called suspended four is that's the three. So what you've got here is root, fifth root, and that's an important thing to remember because that, as you go through most of the open tunings and then into the more modal tunings, that's going to be at the core of nearly all of them. <laughs> and then you have the third, fifth root. So the suspension, why they call it suspension, I don't know, but basically you take that third, so you might have a D, A, D, G, A, D, or near that. And now when I play that, is that major, is that minor? Mm -hmm. Let's turn that note. It's sort of major, but it's equally, that's major, that's minor, that's somewhere in between. Okay? So that's where it gets its name, and the important thing to remember if you want to go, and if I get time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other tunings and how they relate. That root fifth root is at the heart of nearly all. And if you learn that, and you learn where they come from, you get yourself in a position where you're not just learning each new altered tuning as it comes along as a separate beast and entity. You can actually see like a genealogical family, you can see where they relate and where it's at its heart. And when you get to that stage, with some of the chord things I'm going to hand out and show you, you can actually find your way with the same shapes but in slightly different positions on the instrument around an awful lot of tunings that in the past you would have thought, Dad, I don't know it, I don't know mm -hmm. this tuning at all, where am I, where do I start, what do I do? The other thing to say about that, Dad, it's half standard. Those three strings there. E, A, D, G, sorry, are what you have in standard. So any partial chord shapes you play there, E major, C's, A's, G's, and G shape. So if you get lost, any of those three, a partial short chord shape from standard tuning will get you there because it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And what's the nice thing about it is, because you've got this suspended modal, the other strings that hang around it usually work with it. It's quite hard to find a jarring combination where the other strings aren't supporting as opposed to jarring and getting in the way. So that gives you a lot of space and freedom if you want to explore it. The other thing I'll get up front is my whole playing of guitar that I've done over 30 years is to get as far away as possible from barre chords, complexity, and horrible stretches. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like more the simple things where you need one or two fingers to find, you know, and let the resonance of the rest of the instrument work around it. There are other players that play in Dadgad, like Pierre Lens, Susan, who can also play Django, Jazzy, chords of stretcher. So, you know, you can go loads of different ways, or like Martin Carthy, mm -hmm. who finds every single key to play in the tune that he does. That's not where I'm at, and what I'm trying to show you from my chord stuff and arrangements is more of the open, airy stuff, letting things ring 
and to go melodic. So, is everyone happy with that so far as to? Yeah. It doesn't quite seem as weird and wacky and out there. David Graham going to Morocco, getting stoned and suddenly going from, in a sense it is, you go from that nature and instantly find yourself in this tune. But he's in the right place because a lot of that African music, the modes and keys and stuff mm -hmm. they play, that guy is, is absolutely perfect. Shout out to Cretney when I get any of this wrong, Georgia, you want to add your bit because you know, you've got huge experience with learning a lot in this stuff. So, probably the first thing is if we all get into that guy, and then I'll hand out the corner thing and maybe go through a few shapes and basic chords. Song got a proper note, D note, or something we get around because I've just got it relatively. Yeah. So, yeah, already just using one finger as opposed to the uh, giving two fingers. There's an awful lot going on, very simple arrangement that you can do. The other thing to say about that, Gad, is you can get aimlessly lost in it. The sort of spacey tuning that you can just wander around and say, man, this sounds wonderful and not really get anywhere. And that's great for the first few times you do it. But put a bit of structure behind it. Uh, and it is a lovely versatile tuning that you can play all sorts of. You can play blues, you can play pop, you can play traditional. It, it will suit itself to lots of different stuff. So, I probably haven't got enough printed out. So it might be a case of one between two. You want to? Okay. 
loads more in there. The A7's an interesting-ish one. It's one Martin uses a bit. It's got a great arrangement of uh, with a little help of my friends that uses that chord. Don't worry too much about it. The G chord, second fret of the fifth string. And another really great shape for that guy is the second one there, which is fifth string, sixth and fifth string of the fifth fret. Open fourth string and the fourth string of the third. I do it sort of that way, like you would do an E major sort of shape, but with a gap in the string. And that, and that, you can simplify, you can take it so you just press in the fifth and third as well. That's a movable one. You can get an A, two frets up, and you've got an A. Move it down, look up, you've got an F. Another fairly common one, and again, if you think about it, C chords can be quite hard in Dad Gad, they don't work quite as well because the suspension doesn't sit with it. But you've got basically that part of the C chord that you take normally, which is the uh, third fret, fifth string, second fret, fourth string. And again, the suspension's a bit odd, so sometimes if you put that uh, second, third fret, the second string in with it. Which is a bit like that. C, C9 is it that you play, if you're playing C chord in standard, that, that sort of works as a C. And slide that up two frets, you've got another version of the D. The F chord, which is a real bugger in standard, the simplest one is just it's like a power chord if you're playing a drop D or in rock, just third fret, bottom three strings. Or you can close it up to so that G. And then you get the really hard ones, like if I stand in the B flat, you think the other plug me into the big barrow. It's just, you get that really suspended B flat chord. And then you can go up into all these turrets of the B, E flat. But basically, once you've got that as a structure, just thinking where the scale moves and thinking yeah. shape and moving one or two frets, you can more or less work out simple chords of only one or two fingerings that certainly if you're playing finger style is going to give you more than a voicing that will feel like that chord without having to do a lot of these horrible barre things that you have to do in standard sometimes. Then if you go into the minor, um, A minor, if you think of you play that as an A minor in standard, your second string is down. So, so basically you move up two frets to there and you end up with that <laughs> A minor. Or you can suspend it by that and you get suspended. That's almost mobile now because that is one of the A shapes. Put it there and you've got an A major, put it there. It's unresolved, it could be minor. That's definitely minor. But you could equally play that if you're accompanying something that's been played in a minor key. And it will work that minor resolution on it, it's, it's got the essence, you know, the uncertainty, the essence behind it. Um, which other 8 minor one did? The 7 5. So, remember I showed you that G shape down here, which was one fret behind. You just move that up two frets, but because it's a minor chord, you flatten down one. So, rather than being that shape, you move it up, take that finger down one. So some of the progressions you can do is taking that shape and it's a bit like the tone tone semitone as you move down, keep it, there you get major, minor, move it up, you get the next major. So you can do these sort of there's an F sharp minor, where it's basically that shape but move down two frets apart. So you, you can get similar shapes where you only have to move with one finger by one fret and you can do passing around this of chords and come down major minor and major minor. Uh, e minor is it's like that power chord in F. Move that down, you've got suspended, you've got suspended E minor chord. So you can work out where you want to fret any other notes to go with it. But that's your basic structure of the E minor. The B minor can be a little bit tricky. 
That one, that's one. It's like B flat, but moved up. So that's second fret, fifth string, fourth fret, fourth string. And sometimes drop in the fourth fret on the third string as well. That'll give you a B minor. You can also play it. F sharp minor I showed you, which was that one, that G shape moved down the fret and that one stretched one. C minor, if you wouldn't normally play, just think of it as play the C. To go to a minor, you flatten. So take that one down to there, and you mean you've got a minor feel to it, in C minor. D minor, you can play that to a D minor tune, which is the modal. Or you, third fret on the first string gives you a definite D minor feel. The simplest G minor is probably that one there, which is the first fret of the fifth and second strings. But there's another one that comes from that G major shape there, with that one flat down to the third. I'll give you another G minor. So there's lots I'm throwing at you. I mean, it's you need to go away and look and think. But from very few shapes, you can construct an awful lot of chord voicings and variants. And the other thing is, it only occurred to me actually the other day, there's been lots of queries on guitar forums as to why you have fret markers on third, fifth, seventh, ninth, sometimes banjos are tenth, and all the rest of it twelfth. One of the reasons I read that made sense was it was a minor pentatonic scale as you go up. But there's also the, the cage, if only you come across the cage theory of music. But basically what that is, is you take a shape, you want to play a C shape, you play it down here if you're doing the standard, C. If you then think like you put capo on the third fret, you play it in A. Think you put capo on the seventh, and you play G. You've got C again, and then put capo there play an E, and then it cheats a bit because you go octave, and to me you're really playing that C shape again, but it's like a D. So if you think of those 3, 5, 7 and 9 as moving barrets, if you want to find voices, say we're doing an A chord, so A would go there at the beginning, C, A, G, so I go up there, and I look for my G shape with that as a bass, you're up here, that shape shows you, so there's your A, voicing to it. C, A, G. So now we go up here, do we? Up in there, that was A, G, C, A, G. We want an E here, don't we? That'll be there. And it's almost the same shape again, because what you're now doing is you're capoing there, and you're playing that part of the E major that you'll play. And then you come up here, C, A, G, E, D, so, there you go, that's the D shape you had down there, now with that. So in a sense, these dots are useful in standard as well as um, the dagger tuning, but it's something Martin Simpson will teach you as you go through. If you want to find a different voicing to a chord as you go up the neck, think of that cage thing. So if you're looking for a C variant somewhere up here, work out where you are and where you want it, and work out in the cage system what shape you do, play that shape and then take it away till you get the, the voicing, the, the pairing you want to do your uh, chord accompaniment to the music. And you, you can find zillions of the, you can fill in these charts of nauseam. If you go on the internet, lots of people fill them in, but the thing I hate is most of them have got bloody big barrets and they like playing Django jazz chords to find some of these weird and wacky. And if that's what you want to do in that then fine. But you, from this simple basic shape, you should be able to find your way around and do melodic structure and arrangement. So is that, that's a lot of stuff I'm pumping out at you here, but hopefully it's stuff, some of which will mm -hmm. stick as you go away and, and do it. Is there any questions on that bit before I go on to an arrangement? Okay. That's good. That's good. Right, well this, this Lawrence Tuber piece on yesterday, as I say, the really great thing about it, probably, it's probably best if I hand this out afterwards, I'll just play it, which I'll get on. 
you're ever going to do arrangements, the important thing to know first is the melody. You need to know where the melody sits. So if you ever want to do an arrangement of the tune, play the melody. Keep playing the melody so you've got the melody. Play the melody in a different register, in a different octave. And there's loads of places on guitar you can do it. You can move down strings, play in the lower register. You can move up linearly in the middle and down and up strings. But you really do need a melody in your head. The second thing then to think around it is what chordally is going on around the piece that at its basics you can just play part of that chord to do it and then if you get clever you can look at mm -hmm. inversions, minor substitutions if you want to change the mood slightly and all that sort of thing. But if you don't know the melody it's pointless going down to that bit because you know you'd be lost right from the word go. So this piece that Lawrence Huber did, and I think it's reasonably close to what he did, if not just take it to my arrangement of it. Um, well, let's hand them round so you've got one between two. I'll look at Frisses again because I think I know it to play, but I wrote some notes on the back. And it's always good, I find, because I work with a program called Tablet Edit, it's always good to write out music in tablature as you do it, because you understand an awful lot more of the structure of what's going on, just by seeing if you have to go down the discipline of working out how many bars there are, what key it's in, how does it all work. Like, I didn't realise, well, the structure of yesterday is obviously A and B, or verse chorus, depending on how you want to look at it. But I didn't realise until I tapped it out that the verse has got seven bars and the chorus has got eight, which is interesting for the start, because if you play lots of uh, traditional music, it's usually eight bars, eight bars, and you have A parts and B parts. And it's also got interesting repeats, because it's, it's gone back there. If you read the notes right at the end, and it's very small writing, it goes A, A, B, A, C, A. It's a structure. How it's doing it. It's two verses, then you get a chorus, then you get a verse, then you get a chorus. But right, two verses, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, and then it's got the end. Which again is interesting in itself, because again, a lot of the stuff if you do Irish tradition, it's either A, B, A, B, maybe C comes in occasionally, or you do A, A, B, B. Occasionally, when it gets interesting, you'll see whether it's done and use like an A, A, B, B, A, B. And if you listen to music, sometimes you hear things and think, oh, that's interesting, it's sounding different. But you don't always break it down, analyse and see how a composer is, is bringing in interest, variation. Same thing with when you start tossing in minor substitutions for chords, changing the mood in different, you play it through three times one way, then all of a sudden it'll come in something differently. And you, you appreciate and you hear it, but sometimes it's good discipline just to say, well, ooh, that was, I like that, what's going on here? Because if you ever do want to get into doing your own arrangements and, and playing, seeing what other people are doing, particularly on other instruments as well, listening to lots of things like flute music or fiddle music and, and that sort of stuff, and then just taking the time to think a little bit, it can give you some deep and meaningful things. But what I've got on the back there is the chordal structure, which we all probably know and love. It, it, it's in F, so you've got in the chord, in the verse bit, you've got the first bar, which is all F. Then you've got the first two bits of the next bar in E minor, seventh, goes into A. Then you're back into D minor, B flat, C, F, D minor, G, B flat, F. So you can see the chords that you're going to have to bring in once you've got the melody under there. So if you think about it, you've got the Fs for yesterday, E minor 7, just moving down one. What do we go after that? A, all nine, and you're onto that A chord that I showed you. And D minor, you don't even need that in there to suggest that that gives you the D minor is playing. Then you're into the C, whoops, now we're into the B flat, which is that, that one there that I showed you. Two finger chords again. Then you're into the C, which can either be that part of the C or that part of the chord on it. Uh, then you're into the G, whoops, sorry, then we're into the, back to the F, D minor, G, D flat, F, okay? And then if you look at the chorus, you've got E minor 7, one, she, A, and to go, one, she. C, B flat, back to the C, that's the F, A, D minor, C, B flat, C, and then back to the F. Okay? So that basically, if you're just playing down at this 
normal familiar end, and I haven't done any variations up here, you can work out variations here if you want. That basically is your chord structure. So you, you, you know what the tune's doing in terms of its A's and B's, you know you've got seven on the verse, and then you've got eight on the chorus, and you know chordally where it's going. So if you put all that together, what you end up with, if you're lucky, something that goes. And it flows a lot more than it would in that standard because you just think, you know, dad, dad, D's, G's, and the rest of it. F, fuck mm. me, can't play. And it is just mostly two, three finger. So if you want to spend five, ten minutes, because I played it round and round, basically, you just got the two parts, the seven bar and an eight bar, and that's it, you just keep repeating, and they're quite simple. So if you want to, I can, like uh, Martin Carthy would take you through and you have a go, and I can show you one playing product. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to? Take it away. And, uh, so, has everyone got a look at the tab they can do? But sometimes it's easier if you just. <coughs> 